Um, the Church of Smyrna is the message I want to share with you. Jolene and I were studying this the other day in our evening devotion, and it was a very fascinating study to me, and I just thought I needed to share it with you. So in the book of Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, Jesus gives his message to the seven churches in Asia. And the church of Smyrna is the second of these seven churches. Yes, we live in the time period of the church of Laodicea. Laodicea is the message for our time. But I believe there's some important lessons that we can glean from the church of Smyrna. It's also known as the persecuted church. So I want to share this study with you, and I hope you're blessed by it. But before we dive in, let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I want to thank you for your word. I want to thank you for the lessons that are in here that you can teach us. Lord, I pray for your Holy Spirit now to guide me. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2, we're going to take a look at the message to the church of Smyrna. And it's only three verses. But I think there's still a lot to glean from this. Revelation 2, and I'm going to start in verse 8. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know your works and your tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which you shall suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried. And you shall have, what? Tribulation, ten days. Be you faithful to death, and I will give you the crown of life. So, how many of you know where Smyrna is located? All right. I, don't, I didn't have time to put this on a PowerPoint. I wish I did, but it's in what they call modern-day Turkey. It's right on the coast. And actually, the word Smyrna comes from the word myrrh. If you remember, myrrh was one of the three gifts that was presented to Jesus at his birth. Uh, myrrh is a yellow, fragrant, sap-like resin that comes out of the tree of the um, comifora trees that are found in Africa and the Middle East. And the way they harvest myrrh um, they take a knife and they usually cut a ring around the bark or damage the bark in some way. And this sap or this resin oozes out of the injured part of the bark and then it dries there. And then they come and harvest it. And myrrh is a very expensive spice and it's used to make perfume and incense. And if you remember, they also used myrrh um, when they went to embalm Jesus' body. <clears throat> So the history, the time period of the history of Smyrna was from about 100 A.D. to 313 A.D. And I want to point something out interesting in verse 10. Let's look at this again together. Fear none of those things which you shall suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried and you will have tribulation for how long? Ten days. Ten days or ten years, actually. You've got to remember this. This is, when this was written, this was a prophecy. So we must know that the day for a year principle applies. Remember, Ezekiel 4, 6, I have appointed thee each day for a year. So let's take a look at how this applies and how this was fulfilled. Um, I started putting together this, this study on paper yesterday, and I spent most of the day actually studying the history. I'm very fascinated with history, and I want to share with you some of the things I learned. How many of you guys like history? Well, if you like history, you might like this, this, this study today. Um, under Diocletian, he was a Roman emperor, Christians suffered intense persecution and were cruelly put to death and tortured. And the worst part of that persecution lasted in this 10-year period. Um, I studied out history to see if I could prove that from the prophecy. And let me share with you what I found. 
The crisis of the third century, and I, I don't have time to really go into what that is. If you don't, you're going to have to look that up on the internet. But there was something called the crisis of the third century, also known as the military anarchy or the imperial crisis, which was from 235 to 284 AD, was a period in which the Roman Empire nearly collapsed. The crisis ended due to the military victories of Roman emperors and the succession of Diocletian and his implementation of reforms in 284. I also, as I was studying, learned that the emperors often were mighty military leaders. Rome was known for its military might, after all, was it not? And if someone wanted to advance in that empire, he needed to gain the respect of not only the people, but of the military. And that's really not a new concept as we look at history. We see this in Bible times in the time of the kings, don't we? Saul, the first king of Israel, he promoted Jonathan to play a big role in his military, right? His cousin Abner, who was he? He was the commander of the military, of the armed forces of Israel. And his relatives were put in these important positions so they could gain prominence in the military and among the people. King David was a warrior himself. His nephews were among the mighty men of Israel, most notably Joab, who was the commander of uh, King David's army. This was also the case with Diocletian. He was a soldier who worked his way up the ranks. And when he got to the top, he appointed members who were also soldiers, members of his family, to leadership roles in the empire. Diocletian, after ascending to power, then made a decision to divide the Roman Empire into a tetrarchy. How many of you are familiar with this part of history? That simply means he divided it in four parts, and there was a man running or ruling each portion. You had two senior emperors, and you had two junior emperors, which were called Caesars. So one of the tetrarch, Galerius, who incidentally was the adopted son of Diocletian, and the junior Caesar, who ruled Asia Minor, and again, this was the region where Smyrna was located. He ruled that region. Um, he worked diligently to convince his father that the Christians were the cause of the crisis in the empire. And I'll get into why he thought that. The main reason for launching the great persecution was his belief that the God's wrath caused the third century crisis. He argued that the only way to win back the divine favor was to re return to the ancient gods. Diocletian's great persecution, as it was known, was the last and most severe persecution of the Christians in the Roman Empire. In 303, the emperors Diocletian, Maxim, Maximum, Galerius, and Constantius, who was also the father of Constantine the Great, issued a series of edicts rescinding Christians' legal rights and demanding that they comply with traditional religious practices. Did that raise some eyebrows there? Well, we'll get into that. Later edicts demanded universal sacrifice, ordering all inhabitants to sacrifice to the gods in order to maintain stability in the empire. You see, Galileus felt they needed to have the country together and they needed to turn back to these pagan gods. He was working hard to maintain stability in his empire. And to this point, there was battles and fighting and battles and fighting. And at this time, when Galileus was in, in, in leadership, when he was actually the supreme emperor, now the Persians were knocking at his back door. So he was facing uh, battles at every turn. So failure to comply with the law resulted in severe punishment, including death. Of course, the Christians, although loyal citizens, could not comply with the law requiring them to worship a false deity, so they were persecuted. And during this time of persecution, Christians were put to death 
by the most heinous means imaginable by men. I studied some of the things they did for the sake of our young audience. I'm not going to say what they did, but it was not good. It was a very frightful time for the Christians living in Smyrna. This went on until Galerius, who eventually became successor of Augustus and supreme ruler, rescinded the edict in 311 AD after becoming very ill with a grievous sores and infection and shortly thereafter died. In fact, this man, history tells us, was so evil that he started killing his physicians. His, he had this infection that was eating away at his, his body, and he, his body was smelling like it was rotting away, and the physicians couldn't come into the same room with him. It was so bad. And it infuriated him that they were hesitant to come to him, so he started exterminating them. Um, and it says, actually, as I was reading the history, he died eaten of worms. We've heard that before in Scripture, right? History tells us it may have even been Constantine who actually rescinded the edict and only convinced Galerius to sign it. So who's Constantine? Constantine was the son of Constantius, and he was the nephew of Galerius. And during the time of the Tetrarchs, the, as, the, as the older senior ones were dying, the younger ones would fight for supremacy, and Galerius actually became the supreme and took over after um, Augustus passed away. And he died in 311. So, but the persecution didn't officially end until Constantine the Great, who was then elevated to supreme emperor following the death of Galerius, signed the Edict of Milan in AD 13, 313. How many of you remember the Edict of Milan? That's a pretty, pretty common thing in history. So there you have it. There's the 10 years that the Bible predicted, 303 to 313 AD. Is the Bible right or not? Yes or no? It's always right. It's always right. I like being able to study into this and find the history and prove the Bible, what it says to be correct. During this particular time in history, a church leader named Polycarp, who was the bishop of the church of Smyrna. How many of you heard of Polycarp from history? A number of you have. Um, he was an interesting character, very faithful man. Very faithful man. He led, and when it says bishop, that's what the term they use for the leader of the church. He was like an apostle of the church. He, he was actually a disciple of, of the apostle John, and he became one of the apostles of the church, um, of the early church. He too eventually was arrested for not complying with the laws of the land. The Roman governor demanded that he offer incense to the gods of Rome and acknowledge Caesar as his god. He refused and calmly replied, Eighty and six years have I served him, and he did me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? He then was executed by flame and by the sword. It's interesting, as I was studying this, they, they put him to the stake, and the fire did not harm his body. And those that were executing him got very frustrated at that, so they sent a soldier in, in there with a sword to finish him off while he was in the flame. But the church that suffered intense persecutions was also the purest of the seven churches in Revelation. If we look at these verses, there's no reproof against this church in the scripture. Her spiritual experience was a rich one. Her love for Jesus was steadfast and true. But nonetheless, there was intense persecutions. You know, looking at these verses, it occurred to me that there are some lessons we can learn from this for our day, for our time. You know, Satan still uses the same old tricks, doesn't he? He uses trials, tribulations, and storms to destroy us. He tries to discourage us and get us to give up. The truth is, we will all face storms. Let's look at it. Turn with me to John 16, 33. Let's listen to what, what Jesus has to say. 
John 16, 33. Jesus speaking here. These things I have spoken to you that in me you might have peace. So he's always offering peace. He's about to give them a warning of what's coming. But first he starts out giving them peace. In the world you will have tribulation. And some of your versions might say trouble. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Storms are part of life. Storms are to be expected. Storms are dark and difficult. Storms are different in intensity. Storms reveal what matters most. And storms teach us unconditional trust in God. Some of you may even be going through storms right now. But when we are faced with trouble or loss, it causes us maybe to look at life a little differently. I like to look at things in the perspective of my relationship with Jesus. When we focus on what matters most in our lives, we should be focusing on our relationship with Jesus, right? You know, when Julian was in the OR on Monday, I was, I was sitting there in the waiting room and they gave me a little card that, on, first off, there was a monitor, big monitor like that, on the wall at the Kootenai Hospital in the waiting room. And on it, there was a bunch of colors, and each line represented a patient and where they were in the process. It didn't have the patient's name, just their case number. They were a number. It had the doctor's name, and it it, again, it showed where they were in the process. And according to my little card they gave me, light green meant she was in the OR. Okay? So I'm sitting there. Yes, I'm in prayer during this time. I actually brought my computer hoping I could get some work done, but I couldn't concentrate. So I was looking at that monitor. I, I sat where I could just see that monitor. And the little card said, estimated time, 90 minutes. And that, that's basically what they told me. Um, they did say that Yes, anybody who goes under anesthesia might never wake up, okay? I wasn't worried. I, 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 I trusted the Lord. I wasn't worried about it. I knew it was a relatively routine procedure. But an hour went by, and it was still light green. An hour and a half went by, light green. An hour and 15 minutes went by, light green. Two hours went by, light green. So where does your mind go? <laughs> You start thinking, wow, sometimes I feel like I'm not in control. I don't like not being in control. She, but I knew she was in God's hand. You know, oftentimes when we are facing storms, we are not in control of the situation. But God is. Look at this promise in Romans 8.28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Friends, don't let Satan use the storms of life to destroy you. Rather, let God use the storms to strengthen us. What Satan means for our destruction, God frustrates him and uses those things to our benefit. So let me ask you something. Do you think Jesus understands when we're going through storms? Yes or no? Jesus is acquainted with loss. When he was arrested at the Garden of Gethsemane, all his friends, all his worldly friends fled him. He understands. Jesus is acquainted with sorrow. Isaiah 53.3 says, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Let's look at verse 9 again here in our scripture, Revelation 2, 9. I know your works and tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. He not only knows your profession, he knows what's really going on in your life and in your heart. And that's actually reassuring, right? 
Whatever challenges you're facing, whatever you're going through in life right now, he knows and he cares. And we always need to remember that. Jesus predicts the future here in verse 9 and 10. He predicts the future for this church of Smyrna. And he also, it can relate to us. And the future he predicted was tribulation, poverty, suffering, and prison. Wow, not good. This is kind of a bleak prediction here, isn't it? He told this faithful church, Remember, this is the church that had no rebuke. This was a faithful church. He told them that these things would happen. Satan always uses storms of life to discourage us and wear us down. But God uses the storms of life to strengthen our characters. Listen to this quote from Courage and Conflict. It is by close testing trials that God disciplines his servants. He sees that some have powers which may be used in the advancement of his work. And he puts these persons upon trial or test. In his providence, he brings them into positions that test their character and reveal defects and weaknesses that have been hidden from their own knowledge. He gives them opportunity to correct these defects and to fit themselves for his service. He shows them their own weakness he teaches them to lean upon him, for he is their only help and safeguard. Thus his object is attained. They are educated, trained, and disciplined, prepared to fulfill the grand purpose for which their powers were given them. Encouraging conflict, page 46. That's encouraging, right? And it's not that Jesus en enjoys seeing us go through tribulation, but sometimes he allows it for our own benefit. And that's why, friends, it is so important that we maintain a close relationship with him. So why? So we can learn to trust him. Brother Ed, in our Sabbath school for the youth class upstairs, we're going to Steps to Christ. And what are we teaching? You've got to get to know Jesus because you've got to learn to trust him. When you learn to trust him, you can make it through any storms that might come in your life. Yes, we are not today facing the trials and tribulations like they did in the church of Smyrna. But when we do face trials, we can still be assured of his promises that he will be with us and he will remain faithful and our reward is sure. Amen? That's good news. When storms come, guys, there are really only three outcomes or three ways that we react to storms. I want to go over these because this is important. Um, as we were studying this, Jolene was thinking about this. She said, you know what? She said this. There's only really three ways that people react to storms. First, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were tried. Were they tried? Yes or no? Yep. They were tried pretty severely. But they did not fall. They purposed in their heart not to devile themselves and they purposed to trust in God. But let me tell you something. These men were faithful. Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, were they saved from the fire? They went to the fire. They went to the fire. Jesus saved them through the fire. Daniel, did he get saved from going into the lion's den? This is Daniel, God's man. He went to the lion's den. See my point? God saved them through their trials. He doesn't promise that we won't go through them, but he promises to be with us when we do go through them. Also Polycarp, the leader of the Smyrna church we were talking about, he stood fast, and he was willing rather to give up his life than to compromise his faith. The second one, I want to talk about Peter for a minute. Peter denied Christ, did he not? He declared before this night, remember, he declared how strong he was. But he was putting his faith where? In his own strength. Peter fell. 
Sometimes the storms of life knock us down, don't they? They can. But he got up again, and praise God he got up again. And Peter will have the crown of life because Jesus promises if we put our faith and trust in him, even if we fall, we can get up again and put our faith in him. Third, King Saul. He faced trials, but he fell and he didn't get up again. He did not trust in God. He kept falling deeper and deeper, and he never tried to get up. In fact, most of his monarchy was a storm, was it not? Saul was not faithful in the death. And sadly, Saul died a lost man. We're not lost because we might fall. We're only lost if we decide not to get up again and put our eyes on Jesus and trust in him. Amen? Jesus tells his church, be faithful to me until death and I will give thee the crown of life. He says, be faithful in me. Don't give up. These trials will come. He says right here, I am the first and the last. I was here before you came here, and I'll be here long after you're gone. I know the beginning, and I know the end. And I can tell you confidently, if you put your faith in me, you will have the reward. Can we trust Jesus, yes or no? That's a promise we can take to the bank. In studying this history, I also found that the early Christians of this period were not persecuted merely because they worshipped Jesus. It was because they refused to worship Caesar as God. Mm, This gets interesting. The more I dig into history, the more I couldn't stop studying. After all, the people of the Roman Empire had their own beliefs. They had their own practices. They had their own gods. But what made the Christians different was their refusal to add to their devotion the worship of the emperor. Stephen Williams, a British historian and author of a biography he wrote on Diocletian, he writes, it was scarcely enough for Bishop Dionysus to protest that Christians were loyal citizens who prayed for the health of the emperors. What could the most reasonable magistrate reply except to ask why, in that case, they could not demonstrate their loyalty in the proper way like everyone else? Rome was tolerant, but it was not a modern secular liberal state which demands very little of its citizens beyond passive compliance with the law. Genuine loyalty could hardly be divorced from worship of the genius of the emperor in the way that was laid down. That's from Diocletian and the Roman Recovery, page 169. Wow. So it wasn't just because they worshiped Jesus. They refused to follow a law that went against God's commandment. Does that sound familiar? I love this country, guys. But I also know that this great country that I love will someday force me to make a difficult decision. We know the time will come when forced worship of a false god or a false system will be required. How will we respond? I hope I'll be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I pray that you all will be. Say, we don't have to give this any consideration. We, we know what we're going to do. We're going to follow God. Our trials today strengthen our trust in Jesus. And they're preparing us for the great test. Does that make sense? Our trials today are strengthening us now. So when the greater tests come, we can be ready. This is not a time to be conforming to the world. If we're holding on to the world with one hand right now, I'm afraid that we won't pass the great test when it comes to us. We have the promise of eternal reward. But God's promises, according to Ellen White, are all on condition of humble obedience. This is the time for our church to be sharing the Bible and preaching the straight truth. 
not tickling people's ears, not trying to bring people in with entertainment or trying to look like the world just to make people comfortable in their sin. I praise God our church isn't there at this point. But it's out there. People need the Lord. People need to be comfortable with their relationship with Jesus Christ and uncomfortable with sin. Please say amen to that. People need to be uncomfortable with sin. The people of the church of Smyrna were faithful, and Jesus encouraged them to continue in their faithfulness, even though they would suffer persecution. He knows their trials, and he will reward their faithfulness. I don't know what storms each of you might be going through right now, but I'm reasonably certain of this. Every one of you, including me, falls into one of three groups. You're going through a storm right now. You have gone through a storm. Or you will go through a storm. But remember Jesus' words, be faithful unto death and I will give thee the crown of life. Let Jesus lead in your life. He is the only one that can bring us peace, give us assurance of our eternal reward. Friends, don't let Satan win this great controversy in your life. Our God is more powerful. He's already guaranteed us a reward. I love this verse in John 10, 10. The thief comes not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Remember Smyrna. Remember the myrrh. Even in the trials of life, be the myrrh. Be the sweet smelling savor that shows everyone that you trust in God. Who knows? Your trials might one day help somebody. Look at our study of Job. His trials actually defended the character of God. And it helped people throughout the centuries gain trust in God. No matter what you might be going through, don't give up. Remember the words of Jesus. Fear none of those things which you shall suffer, but be faithful unto me until death, Jesus says, and I will give thee the crown of life. You know what? After the two hours of staring at that monitor, it finally turned green. And it said, in closing. And then it turned pink, which says, in P-A-C-U. Medical people, is that right? It's actually the recovery room, I call it. (sighs) I was so relieved right? The doctor, bless her heart, what a kind doctor. She came out, big smile on her face, and I knew everything went well. And she said, let, come into this room, and I'll tell you how it went. And she said, Julian is doing well. She's doing well. And she can go home with you tonight. Praise God, you know how, how much I was relieved? She can go home. Jesus is saying, don't worry, it'll be okay. Soon you can go home with me. Can't wait for that day. I want you to listen to these words of this song that Lisa prepared.
Thank you.